first Sunday of Lent. One of the practices that my daughter Delia and I have taken up this year is spending some time every day with our Lenten Ark. Now what is a Lenten Ark, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> this is a Lenten Ark. It is a little 3D artistic rendering of Noah's Ark with little windows that you open for each day of Lent. It works much the same way an Advent calendar does. Although uh, I was gone this weekend at the women's retreat and my daughter decided to go ahead and have a fast forward Lent, so you know that. <laughs> each little window opening, we get a little picture of an animal with a corresponding scripture verse that helps us follow the entire story of God's reconciling love for humanity that is woven throughout this history of salvation. Each day we get a little more of the story from Holy Scripture, and at the end of this sea voyage, we will be able to see the whole story of God's action. Our little ark seems to be carrying us along the very waters that the Holy Spirit moved over at the beginning of creation. The waters that the children of Israel were led through out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. And of course, our, our ark carries us into the waters that Jesus received the baptism of John in and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from bondage of sin into everlasting life the prayer that we say over our own baptismal waters reminds us. From its earliest days, the church has identified with Noah's Ark. In fact, the Ark used to be used as the very symbol of the church itself. The ancient church saw itself as being afloat on the waters of a chaotic world, one vessel left that was seaworthy and able to navigate through the tempest of this life only because Christ was at the helm. If you were to be saved from the flood of evil that was covering, on, covering the world, you had better be on the boat. <clears throat> this morning we are invited to climb aboard this ark as the church once did. We have been granted voyage on this boat to journey through these sacred stories, to see how the waters of salvation allow all these stories to commingle, to dissolve, into one another, until we realize that we are being carried across the surface of one vast ocean, one vast story of God's love for us. So let's see what's in the water from the deck of the ark. Noah's story has its roots in Adam and Eve's. In the beginning, people lived in paradise. The whole earth, including humanity, had been called out of the chaos into existence, and then proceeded to seemingly do everything it could do to retreat back into chaos. Adam and Eve dwelt in harmony with all of the wild beasts in the earth, but following the fall, Adam and Eve were forced to leave the garden. Genesis tells us a story of humanity that has trespassed across the boundaries established by God in the very beginning. As theologian Lloyd Allen reminds us, ensuing violence increasingly corrupted God's very good creation, sending it sprawling down toward the disordered world from which it was formed. Even the normally very peaceful animals started attacking their human stewards. Again, Allen reminds us that violence polluted the earth itself. So God, grieving over the ruined creation, resolved to destroy the destroyers. God determined to drown in watery chaos the earth and all that breathed upon it, except a remnant, Noah, his family, the animals. While God's solution may seem a shocking response to our modern ears, remember that during the time that this story was written, Gods were always seen as mighty warriors, creating, destroying, and changing human existence as they saw fit. Our almighty creator God was so grieved by the atrocities of his creation that he sought out a solution. 
and he would have been seen to have been within his rights to do so. And yet, our view from the Ark does not show us a heartless warrior. Rather, we see a God hanging up his bow, his weapon. He will no longer be a God that uses his power to uncreate. God chooses another way. In fact, the covenant that he makes with Noah on the mountaintop, where Noah's ark finally comes to its resting place, we see God imposing this covenant that reads almost as though it were a restraining order, not one that binds those remnants of the sinful world, as you might expect, but one that restrains God himself. God takes on this self-imposed vow. As for me, God says, never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And then he hangs his weapon up in the sky and says, I will see it, and I will remember. God will remember the promise that he makes to us and to the whole creation. But will we? To find out, we must sail on further into these holy waters. As we flow through the currents of time, it does not look good. Again, we return to our ways of war, injustice, of ignoring God. So he sends out other lifelines to those of us who are drowning in the waters of evil. He leads us to the waters of the Red Sea and gives us the law, so that we might know the right way to live. And yet still we drown. We sail on and see the prophets who point us back to the God that we have drift, drifted away from. And yet still, we drown. <clears throat> Finally, the currents of our sacred story turn our ark in the direction of the Jordan, to Jesus as he is baptized in the waters of new life. And just as he was coming up out of the waters, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descend upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved, my son, with you I am well pleased. We've not heard language like that from God since he declared creation good. Just like that, he ascended to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And this heavenly revelation rocks our heart as waves from the past seem to change our course that was headed towards certain death. Forty nights and forty days that Jesus spends in the desert wash over us and hearken back to the forty days and nights spent with Noah on his heart. The waves of the past keep rocking us as we are reminded that Jesus enters the desert for those of us who have lost a garden. Another wave reveals to us that Jesus is with the wild beasts, which is in sharp contrast to the peaceful animals that once roamed with Adam and Eve. We notice that even the angels have reversed their behavior. Whereas before, an angel was placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden to keep humanity from returning, now the angels are waiting on Jesus in the desert. And of course, the tempters are here as well. In the Garden, Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent and here, Jesus is tempted by Satan. But this wilderness is a new Eden. This Jesus is a new Adam. And his choices are not Adam's choices. These memories seem to trouble the water, hearkening that something different is happening, something that will change our voyage permanently and forever but we still have further to go on this journey. This river that we travel on will point us to another mountaintop, not one where Noah's ark landed, not the one where the law was handed down to Moses, but the one where Jesus is crucified, Calvary. Just as the heavens were torn apart and Jesus heralded as the beloved Son of God at his baptism, so too was something else torn apart at his death. Mark 15 tells us 
that Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And suddenly our ark comes to a halt. This is the point. This is that pivotal moment on our voyage into the heart of God's movement in salvation history. It is here at the cross that there is a calmness over the waters. A calmness that has not been since the Holy Spirit moved over them in creation. It is here that we see a new creation, a new life offered to us. God has taken our violence, our sinfulness, our pride, our injustice, and he has borne it on himself, just as he did in that covenant with Noah. We have just journeyed through this story. We know how high our evil has risen. And instead of wiping it all out, God stands in our place. As that tidal wave of sin rushes towards us, Jesus steps in. God hangs his bow and his weapon in the sky, and we in turn hang his son on the cross. And yet this is still not the end of this voyage for us. After three days, our sails will fill again, this time with a new wind. One that will blow us into the waters of new life. And this wind will lead us to the empty tomb, the risen Christ, to everlasting life. But we're not there yet. For the rest of these 40 days and 40 nights, remember that you will continue to be on an ark, an ark of the new covenant. Keep the cross in your sights as we are pulled by the currents of this season even ever closer to its realities. Use these 40 days and nights to gaze into the waters of creation that the Holy Spirit continues to move over and calms. Remember that God has chosen to guide our ark into the waters of new life, and that he loves us so much that he has given everything to ensure that our voyage will be a safe one onto the shores of salvation.